It's a legacy of tragedy and accomplishment, of trial by fire, of human spirit, of devastation, but also survival. All those big, big issues that people grapple with around the world on a daily basis and don't even know they're making history when they do it. Harper's Ferry is an example of a permanent community where nature never intended one to be. But because the rivers were so important for travel and for power to our ancestors, this was seen as a great site. Immigrants from many countries came here seeking the American dream. People fought and killed each other here over the American dream and what freedom is and what it means to people. So if nothing else, it's just that simple what freedom means and it's just that big. Harper's Ferry is an example of a permanent community where nature never intended one to be. But because the rivers were so important for travel and for power to our ancestors, this was seen as a great site. These two rivers, the Shenandoah and the Potomac, are really a major reason why Harper's Ferry is here to begin with. Um, Harper was a millwright by trade in addition to being an architect and he immediately recognized the potential for water power here and he didn't waste much time building a mill, a water powered mill just upstream on the Shenandoah River. Robert Harper is considered to be the founder of the town. He came here in 1747 and he was really just looking for a shortcut. He was on his way to Winchester to uh, build a meeting house for Society of Friends and he was told about this place called The Hole and it would shave some time off his journey. He was leaving Frederick City in Maryland, headed to Winchester, Virginia. And he was guided to this spot, this gap in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And there was a man here at the time named Peter Stevens, who was a squatter on Lord Fairfax's land. And Stevens uh, operated a ferry, crude ferry across the river. He was a Dutchman who was basically an illegal squatter. He had no legal title to this property but he did have a uh, log cabin and a corn patch here. Um, so Harper was not the first. Um, he does make an offer to Stevens to purchase you know, his land and uh, some of his uh, uh, equipment from him. Stevens ultimately sold this land to Harper, even though Stevens didn't own it. Harper ended up buying it twice, once from Stevens and once officially from its rightful owner, Lord Fairfax. So Harper hammers out a contract, purchases some land at the point here where the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers meet, and um, does start, as you probably guessed, operating a ferry boat service uh, across both of those rivers. And that was a major crossing point for travelers as they came east and west and north and south through this gap you know, into this part of the valley. If things had been a little different, it might have been Stevens Ferry, who knows, but, um, but Harper ends up becoming the legal landholder here. If geography is destiny, then this place was slated for big things. Two rivers coming together at a major pass in the Blue Ridge Mountains. So people were going to come here anyway. They were funneled in by the landscape as Native Americans had been up to 8,000 years ago. Harper put it on the map, but it was a, a pinprick on the map. Uh, eventually, the Virginia legislature recognized this place as Mr. Harper's Ferry at Shenandoah Falls. Thomas Jefferson was arguably probably the most famous visitor ever here at, at Harper's Ferry. Um, he came here uh, in October of 1783. Jefferson stays in the Harper House, which again at that time was an inn and a tavern. Um, this was one year after Harper's death. Um, and of course, if you know anything about Jefferson, he loved to study, among other things, nature. He loved to study flora and fauna, and he just couldn't resist when he came here at that time to this natural surrounding, uh, to hike up onto the hillside above the Harper House and above Harper's Ferry. He went up the hill, I believe his reference was that he went up the hill past the ordinary, and he took the view up there. Uh, he had 
he wrote in his notes on Virginia that the view was worth a voyage across the Atlantic. He, according to the story, comes upon a stone slab kind of teetering on the edge of a larger slab on a cliff here above Harper's Ferry. And Jefferson hops up on that rock, he pulls out a pen and paper, he starts taking down some notes on his observations of the rivers and the mountains and the water gap and really the northern Shenandoah Valley. And was awestruck by the scene he saw before him. Well, what grew up around the view was a dirty little town. <laughs> and so it was noisy, it was smoky, it was crowded. Surveyors came here when Harper was here, and um, George Washington was among them. He was 16, 17, learning the trade, so he began to know this area very well. He came back as an adult in 1785, mapping out these rivers to be interstate highways, trying to connect the east with the west. And again, the gap in the Blue Ridge is the key to the development in Washington's plans here. And then as our first chief executive, Washington was in a power to really make things happen, in a position to make things happen with the power to do so. And so he, um, he said that if we desire to secure peace, it must be known that we are at all times ready for war. Grand idea was to connect the Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac River with the Ohio River out west. This is before the coming of the railroad, so essentially you're gonna have all these ideas to develop and break through the mountains, and this is part of his plan. So Harpers Ferry is going to sit along a big canal. It's going to get the weapons east and west, the supplies east and west, naturally defendable. You have iron ore. You have virgin timber. He said the uh, the water power is inexhaustible. He called it the most eligible spot on the river. And um, a new city was going up downstream, the city of Washington in the territory of Columbia and a federal installation upstream might help prop up this new city going up downstream, maybe provide protection for it as well. And Washington knew this spot was far enough inland to be safe from invasion by sea. He also knew all the raw materials were here. And the town boomed in a big way because of that federal infusion of dollars, bringing in armorers, workers. Uh, think of a military base and all the service industries and neighborhoods growing up around it. Well, the armory had uh, at its height 22 buildings, um, 400 workers, a 90-foot smokestack, which to visitors in the town now it's kind of a surprise to imagine there's a smokestack as high as that Catholic church steeple that dominates the town. You're going to make, as an armory worker, you're going to make an entire weapon. And then, of course, later on, they experiment with doing piecework where one person manufactures 100 lock plates for the sides of the weapons or 100 other parts and turns them in for their pay. And then, of course, in 1819, when we come to the arrival of John Hall, and that changes everything. You know. This is uh, Hall's rifle, which is probably the um, most technologically advanced rifle made here. But it was patented by a man from Maine, and he uh, convinced the government that he could make this entirely interchangeable, which we've been seeking for years. Thomas Jefferson was convinced the French could make interchangeable firearms. They couldn't, but um, Hall was able to do it, mainly because he would make it by machinery. So they gave him his own U.S. Uh, government-owned gun factory, and he set up the machinery, and he could hire 14-year-old boys to come in and run the machinery, so he didn't have to be a craftsman to make this. And because it's made by machinery, all the parts interchange. So if you lose a screw on the battlefield, you're not disarmed. You go to the quartermaster or the ordnance sergeant and you get another screw. So this is the beginning of interchangeability in the country at all. Um, other things that had to be made after this that could only have been made by machinery or like um, sewing machines and things like that. So um, I kind of see this as the beginning of the real industrial revolution. Of course, this is uh, you know, a, a giant step forward in, in mass production and, uh, of course, standardized production. Later on, well, today we take it for granted, automobiles, computers, and things like that mm -hmm. uh, benefit from some of these ideas. You know, kind of an important thing, and that means that the production along the Shenandoah and the production along the Potomac at the, both factories, the Hall factory, of course, which is still U.S. government, and the musket factory up here, uh, becomes quite large, and just down the street, at the point where the rivers come together, the arsenal down there fills with firearms. 
So by 1859, even though they manufactured over half a million weapons in Harpers Ferry, 100,000 of those weapons are still in the town, still at the arsenal, and they have no U.S. Army Guard stationed around them, just night watchmen and, and people at the armory. So this is a, a, quite a situation in the making. You know? I would describe Brown as a revolutionary, as a person who saw the institution of slavery that kept the United States of America from achieving um, its real essence and goals of a nation based on the concept that all people are created equal. So he was an icon in American history. And whether you like him or hate him, doesn't make a whole lot of difference. And so what makes Brown complex is this division in American thought that has existed for 150 years about what he did and why he did it and whether he was right or he was wrong. I believe he was right. What he did was wrong. Now, abolishing slavery is absolutely right because uh, slavery was nothing to be put up with. John Brown's family background goes way back to 1800 when he was born in Torrington, Connecticut to uh, parents who were abolitionists. And they told their son, their whole family, that uh, slavery was the sum of all villainies. And as he grew up, Brown actually experienced what his parents had been telling him. He was only 12 years old when he saw a friend of his, a young enslaved boy, beaten with a shovel in the Ohio Territory. And he later wrote, from that day on, I became a determined abolitionist. I think that transformed him. And then as you see um, the move toward the Civil War, that whole period, I think he is becoming more and more radicalized by what is happening to black folks, the Fugitive Slave Act, um, black folks uh, being dragged back to slavery, um, even if they were free, some free blacks being re-enslaved. I think all these things mixed into it. John Brown had a strong belief in God. He believed God ultimately placed him here on this earth for the purpose of ending slavery in the United States. He prayed daily. The Bible was his constant companion. He read the Bible daily. He shared the Bible with family daily, with friends, with his compatriots, with his followers. And so here is a man who is convinced that God had chosen him, that God had spoken to him, not just once, not just twice, but constantly about your job for me is to terminate, end, abolish slavery in the United States. So Brown felt very comfortable in his faith. He felt, felt very comfortable in his communications with God and he felt that God was his protector, God was his diviner, and that his divine mission on behalf of God was to end slavery. He called black people Mr. and Mrs. He had folks eat at his table. He had them work in his uh, businesses. He lived with them. They weren't a people apart for him. They were his brothers and sisters. Brown and his family, as one historian has written, may have been the only white family in America that was not only willing to fight against slavery, but to die to end slavery. And this brings in the other aspect where Brown was different from most others. He was willing to resort to violence. To end At the time of John Brown's raid, Harper's Ferry, Virginia, was home to about 3,000 people. The federal government was the primary employer in town with over 400 people employed at the United States Armory and Arsenal and the U.S. Rifle Factory. And so it was a busy town, noisy, filthy, industrial town, but those were also the sights and sounds and smells of America. A melting pot with Irish, German immigrants mixing here with others of European and African descent. It is also where the North and South meets, not only geographically, but also um, really it is the place where you had people from the North who had settled here from Pennsylvania, people from Eastern Virginia who had settled here. You had free blacks and slaves. You had farms that were being worked without slaves. 
a few slaves or many slaves. And so this was a, a cauldron of the whole country. Harper's Ferry was home to 300 African Americans, only 300, half of them enslaved, half of them free. But in the six counties around Harper's Ferry and including Harper's Ferry, over 23,000 African Americans. About 6,000 of that number, men of military age. John Brown referred to it as the old Kennedy Farm. So he was here in 1859, so you can imagine how old the house really is. If, it could, if the walls could talk, you'd have a hell of a story. And he moved in. Well, he came up and stood on the porch and said, what a wonderful, absolute wonderful place for what we want, being a staging area for the raid on Harper's Ferry. He loved the place. He sent home for Mrs. Brown. She was too busy up in North Elba, New York, which is now Lake Placid. And uh, two little girls volunteered to come down to make it look like a family lived here. That was Annie and her sister-in-law, Martha. And they came down and joined in with, with John and the three boys, Owen, Oliver, and Watson. And then over the summer, they collected their army, the provisional army of the United States, one or two at a time over the week, or two weeks, or a month. And at the end of the summer, they had uh, 21 men hidden in the attic. The old man would go up and read the Bible to him. Jeremiah Anderson was the dormitory chief, and he would unbox some of the weapons and show them how to clean their rifles, which were Sharps rifles, which were very modern in those days. And they went across the road there to a, another cabin, which he had, where they had a thousand pikes over there the poles and the buoy knives, and they would put them together over there. So they, they, they kept relatively busy. But uh, they came close to mutiny there one time, and uh, Owen sort of stopped him from doing that. Uh, the old man was dedicated. And of course, they, all the rest of them were dedicated too, or they wouldn't have been here. John Brown's raid occurred over a span of 36 hours. Started on a Sunday night, October 16th, and went to Tuesday morning, October the 18th. The first thing they did after leaving the Kennedy farm was cut the telegraph lines on the B&O Railroad Bridge, Maryland side of the Potomac River from Harper's Ferry. Then they came into town and all of their targets fell just like a row of dominoes. They seized the railroad bridge. They seized the wagon bridge over the Shenandoah River. They seized the United States Armory compound. They seized the arsenal. They seized the U.S. rifle factory. And then a half a dozen of Brown's men went out into the county to begin capturing prominent slaveholders, begin freeing slaves, and spreading the word that this raid, this campaign, this invasion had begun. Citizens were summoned, church bells, were soon rung, and volunteer militia from all points of the compass by the next day, only a few hours later, would begin marching on the double quick to Harper's Ferry to put down what they were convinced was a slave revolt, which was the single greatest fear of a white southerner. They did not attack John Brown's holdout, his headquarters, the Armory Fire Engine House, at night because there were hostages inside and it would be virtually impossible to differentiate the hostages from John Brown's men. So they waited for daylight on Tuesday the 18th. At daylight, Jeb Stewart walked up to the Armory Fire Engine House under a white flag to speak to the leader of this invasion. Stewart saw that it was useless to negotiate with Brown. The negotiations were dragging on and on. Brown wanted a head start, then he'd release his prisoners and have a fair fight gives you some insight into John Brown's thinking. He only had four men at that point who could carry a rifle with him. He had a few men on the Maryland side as a rear guard. 
but he knew there was a huge crowd outside that surrounded him. He never considered defeat to be an option. Whatever happened to him or however his plans were changed, it was part of God's plan. Stewart saw, again, useless to keep talking, so he gave the prearranged signal. He waved his hat. That was the signal for a hand-picked party of U.S. Marines to storm the building. All of it happened in three minutes. Two of Brown's men were bayoneted by the Marine storming party, the other two captured alive, and all of the hostages were released unharmed. And that was the end of John Brown's run. But what happened after the John Brown raid was this terrified the South. This was a white man who was willing to do this. And they pointed to John Brown and said, this is what you can expect from abolitionism. John Brown's trial after his capture in Harper's Ferry is one of the most important pieces of the whole story. The raid here in Harper's Ferry tactically appears to have been a failure, but strategically, after the raid, John Brown was positioned to make the most of it. And he said the trial for life of one bold man for defending his rights in good earnest would arouse more sympathy throughout the nation than the suffering of all the slaves. That is exactly what happened when John Brown himself was put on trial in Virginia in 1859. The newspaper reporters were there. He knew it. He was speaking to them and all of the civilized world. And he quoted the Declaration of Independence that everyone is created equal. He quoted the golden rule of the Bible as well. And instead of defending himself and claiming innocence, he tried to put slavery on trial. December 2nd, 1859, a beautiful day here in Jefferson County, Virginia. Brown, in fact, when he would come out of his jail cell for the last time, be escorted onto the wagon where he actually would ascend the wagon and ride his coffin, ride atop his coffin to the execution site. And Brown would look around and all that he saw were uniforms. Almost 2,000 Virginia militiamen surrounding the scaffold of John Brown. Brown was escorted up the scaffold and he got to the top step. And just before they put the cover over his head, he looked around and he simply said, beautiful country, beautiful country. That was his last view of this earth. So between 11.15 and 11.20, uh, the hatchet would strike the wood. The trap door would swing open and Brown would fall. And he would hang. And as one poet wrote, for a moment, John Brown hung between heaven and earth. When a Southern poet saw that, he wrote, John Brown hung between heaven and hell. Another one bites the dust. <laughs>